The year is 2050, and this is the Space Watch Research Station, a city in the sky orbiting 1,500 kilometers above Earth. Inside is home and workplace to more than 30,000 people. And what better location for the start of Starlog 13, our Astro Quiz? That's today's mission to answer just some of your questions on space and astronomy. No prizes for guessing the most popular question. Yes, black holes. Question one. What is a black hole? Where can you find one in space? The answer could be in the constellation of Cygnus, near the star Eta. Cygnus X1 marks a spot in the sky that astronomers believe is a black hole. No one has ever seen it, but Cygnus X1 must be a marvel of the universe. A giant star slowly but surely being sucked out of existence. Matter is continuously being drawn away from the star to vanish into the depths of a cosmic conundrum. A star that died perhaps thousands of years ago and fell in on itself, a black hole. Before its collapse, the black hole could have been a twin to the star it's now consuming. Today, it's a plug hole from which nothing can escape. Material is swirled toward its center, traveling faster and faster. It becomes energized and releases X-rays, powerful signals that can be clearly detected on Earth. A black hole can be caused by a huge dying star collapsing under its own gravity and disappearing. At least, that's the theory. Imagine that time and space were a grid. The presence of an object like our sun would gently distort the grid. But make that object a black hole, and the distortion would become a bottomless funnel from whose gravitational pull nothing, including light, could escape. A black hole with a mass equal to that of the Earth would be the size of the dot in the center of this picture. This is what might happen to an object falling into a black hole that weighed just one kilogram at a distance of 10,000 kilometers. Closer at 744 kilometers, it would weigh as much as a man. At 74 kilometers, it would be as heavy as a tractor. Its weight at 10.7 kilometers would be that of a plane. At 268 meters, a supertanker. And at 6.3 meters, the weight of the entire population of the world. Beyond that, nobody knows. Possibly the laws of physics no longer apply. A black hole might lead to another universe altogether. Meanwhile, back in our own universe, what could be nicer than a relaxing walk in space? Mind you, it has its own hazards, like meteoroids specks of cosmic dust that zap around at thousands of kilometers an hour. That's why spacesuits like this have up to 22 layers, to prevent meteoroid punctures. Which leads me to another question. Question 2. What's the difference between a meteoroid, a meteor, and a meteorite? Good question. And for the answer, we must first travel to the asteroid belt. Lumps of rock some of them hundreds of kilometers across, material left over from the formation of the planets. The asteroid belt orbits the sun between Mars and Jupiter. But other cosmic debris, like comets and meteoroids, career unpredictably about the solar system. A meteoroid, if it enters our atmosphere, looks like this. A momentary shooting star, a speck of dust burning up. Or it might look like this. A fireball, a meteoroid the size of an egg, vaporizing as it hurtles toward Earth. As we saw in Starlog 11, there are regular showers of shooting stars. These are simply meteoroids encountering the atmosphere. 
While they are actually travelling in the atmosphere, astronomers call them meteors. If one survives to reach the ground, it's termed a meteorite. Question 3. When will there be colonies living in Earth orbit? My guess is by the year 2100. How about this mining station, which will extract minerals from asteroids clustered on its perimeter? And here's how a space station may be built. Initially, parts will be carried aloft by vehicles like Space Shuttle and its successors. Then, as the station grows, it'll begin to manufacture its own materials and little space tugs will manoeuvre them into position. Some stations will be like gigantic wheels and they'll spin in order to provide a little gravity for those ferrying up from Earth. Inside, there'll be countryside with fields and trees, lakes and clouds, even on the sides and the top where you'd expect there to be sky. Heaven in the heavens. Well, now to something more down to Earth. How does a telescope work? For the answer, we must beam down through the clouds to the planetarium in Northern Ireland. And what else would you expect other than rain? This is the Armagh Planetarium's public telescope. This is a large reflecting telescope of the type used by professional and amateur astronomers all over the world. In fact, it's not merely one telescope, it's a series of three. We start with a tiny one here, which is called a finder. This gives you a rough idea of where you're pointing to in the sky. Then we have another much larger that gives a much more refined view, rather like the eyepiece of a rifle. And then we come to the main telescope itself. It's really a huge collector of light. And this is how it works. The main mirror at the bottom of the telescope is curved and it has a hole in the center. As light from a star or a galaxy falls down the tube, it's first gathered by the main mirror. Then it's bounced up to a secondary mirror and concentrated into an image packed with visual information. Finally, the light is reflected through the hole in the main mirror and into the eyepiece itself. Question 5. What's the best way to start skywatching? Certainly, a pair of binoculars is an excellent way to begin sky watching. They're not expensive, and what you should go for is a pair that hasn't got a very high magnification. And you find this out simply by looking at the figures that you'll find at the top of any binoculars. And you should get a pair that says something like 10 by 50 or 12 by 50. The figure 12 means it has a magnification of 12, and the 50 simply refers to the size of the big lens at the front of the binoculars. With a pair of binoculars like this, you'll be able to explore the sky really well. Now, certainly you won't see any detail on the planets, but you will perhaps catch a glimpse of craters on the moon and learn the constellations and the stars themselves really well. And one of the best things about a space station is that we don't have to worry about gravity. This is a telescope well worth getting, simply if you want to have a look at the stars in more detail, perhaps some of the brighter nebulae and the craters on the moon. But don't be expecting to see anything on Jupiter or the rings of Saturn. It's much too small. Most people actually begin sky watching with a telescope like this. It's called a refracting telescope. And that means it has a big lens at the front which gathers the light. This then comes down the tube to the bottom end, if you like, and that's where we find an eyepiece, which is like a little microscope, and we look through there to get our view of the planets. A telescope like this is not too expensive, and certainly it will give you reasonable views of the planets, and certainly for the moon is simply wonderful. You may notice it also has a small telescope at the top of it. This is called a finder, and it's rather like the guide of a, a scope of a rifle. It'll let you have a, a wide-angle view of the sky so that you know in which direction you're pointing the more powerful telescope itself. Moving on to an even more expensive and more useful instrument, we find this one here. Now, this is an entirely different design from the instruments we've seen so far. It's called a reflecting telescope, and that's because it uses mirrors to collect the light. At the bottom of the telescope tube is a fairly large mirror that collects all the starlight. The light comes down the tube, bounces off the mirror at the bottom and comes right up to a small mirror at the top. And it's through there, through the eyepiece, that we can glimpse the stars and the planets. Now a telescope like this, because it's more powerful, needs a very steady mount. And this one, as you can see, is on a very sturdy metal pillar. 
but also the mount is inclined. In fact, it points toward the pole of the sky. And this makes it very easy to track the stars and the planets as they slowly drift across the heavens. And this movement, of course, caused by the rotation of our own planet, the Earth. Now, if you have a lot of money to spend, or else you're very keen, you could invest in a telescope like this. This telescope is extremely powerful, even though it looks very small. And that's because it uses a series of mirrors and lenses to compact the light. The light comes up and down the tube a number of times, and this makes it this size instead of being about that. Now, you can also connect a camera to a telescope like this and take really excellent photographs of the night sky. But the best way to begin sky watching is through your local society. A useful address might be Junior Astronomical Society, 58 Vaughan Gardens, Ilford, Essex. Time to head for home, and no doubt the ships that will carry us up and down to space stations in the future will be rather like the space shuttle. And this is its flight deck. And who knows how long it will be before the all-inclusive package holiday in Earth orbit. Okay, so competition winners announced next week.